Gordon Ritchie, and I will be your service leader this morning. It's good to have you with us today. Our theme for the month of January is living with intention. And the topic of this morning's service is, why do we go to church anyway? What do we actually get out of it? Well, all will be answered by our minister, the Reverend Rosemary Morrison, who will be talking about why church is important to her and what others have to say about it too. Uh, we're going to start off with our announcements. Uh, we have a few for you this morning, and I'm going to begin. Our tech team is looking for volunteers to assist with the in-person and online component of our Sunday morning services. They are looking for sound techs, camera operators, and people to help with Zoom. Some of these jobs are very straightforward and very easy to do. Um, some are done here uh, up in the loft uh, during the service, and some can even be done in your home on your computer. So uh, they're very straightforward jobs. So we're uh, looking for people to help with that and uh, contact Andrew Mills uh, or contact the church and Andrew will give you all the necessary training you need uh, for these positions. And I know um, Rosemary has one and then I'll get Susan to come forward for one as well. It is uh, with regret that I would like to say that we are postponing our January 22nd uh, workshop with uh, Joan Carolyn from the Canadian Unitarian Council. It's a startup workshop. This happens uh, after a new minister comes to a congregation. The Canadian Unitarian Council sends a staff member to do a start startup workshop. With the increase in the um, Omicron variant, uh, Joan is no longer able to come to us. Uh, the CUC has stopped all travel by their staff people. And we are a little concerned about having a bunch of people here in, in the sanctuary all day long. And it just doesn't make sense for us to, to put our, our people at that kind of risk. So we're gonna postpone it for a month Keeping all of our fingers and toes crossed, I invite you all to do that now, keeping all fingers and toes crossed, that things will settle down and we are going to split it into two Saturdays, February 12th and 19th for two afternoons, one to four on two afternoons. It does decrease the amount of time we're together, so therefore our risk, and um, it'll, it's a little easier because most likely it's going to have to be all online. And so being all online all day long is just too much as we've all experienced. And so that's my announcement and Susan. Um, I am also looking for volunteers for the simplest of all the jobs involved in this service, which is to uh, sit and greet people as they come in. The, the only thing you have to do is be here by 10 after, and uh, most people know the drill about signing the paper, and they'll show you their QR code, and that's all there is to it. But I was here last week, and Mike Keast was doing it, and if you know how many jobs he's doing, it just can't happen. So the, the sheet will be out there. I hope everybody will take a turn. Thank you. And for all the Coriolis members uh, who are with us today and online, Karen and I have made a, an executive decision to hold off choir practice for one more Thursday. And so we'll be live in the sanctuary next week after next. Right. <laughs> okay. Our community extends beyond the Sunday morning services. We have a monthly newsletter available online and you can join our virtual community on Facebook and Twitter. Now let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Let us let go just for a time of the everyday world. We'll quiet ourselves, our phones, and devices, and we'll create a space in this hour to simply be together. In the spirit of life and love, we gather. Let us begin our service with a prelude performed by Karen Mills.
The Unitarian Universalist faith is a creedless community dedicated to a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. We embrace a pluralist philosophy, opening our hearts and minds to the diverse ideas, feelings, and expressions of our world community. Whatever your heritage, whatever your faith, whomever you love, you are welcome here today. Last month, my husband and I attended the opening of the Tawanata, oh sorry, the Tawatina, excuse me, footbridge, which connects the communities of Riverdale and Cloverdale. The Edmonton Arts Council awarded local Métis artist David Garneau to commission uh, a commission in 2016 to create an installation on the bridge celebrating the region's history. He created over 500 paintings that cover the length of the bridge. His artwork and the bridge are both really quite impressive and I would urge you to take a little wander over this beautiful bridge. And so as we gather on Treaty 6 territory, we acknowledge and respect the history, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First People of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. I would like to invite Ruth forward now to light our chalice, and I offer you uh, words by Amy Lloyd entitled, Intentions and Trust. Today, I want to greet joy without a trace of suspicion. I want to open my eyes to the light without a blink of dread. I want to look at my past without a whisper of shame. I want to look at my future without a hint of fear. Today, I want to dance without pausing to think. I want to belly laugh without caring who hears. I want to open my arms and twirl in the sun until I fall breathless, free to be myself, full of the joy that I open to allow completely letting go without even a smudge of suspicion or a wink of hesitation. That's my intention. It's what I want. I actually told some of my coworkers about this and ended up copying this, and it's now in our staff room at work. And I also copied it, and it's going to be on my desk. Beautiful words to live by and to read every day. We have an opening hymn. It's number 360 in your hardcover hymn book. Here we have gathered. For those of you who are joining with us online, your words will be coming up on your screen. We invite you to sing lustily, knowing that, yes, on some level we will hear you. And so let us rise in body and spirit here in the sanctuary as we join in singing hymn number 
think I got it in the right place. Ah, yes, indeed. Welcome. I noticed you don't have a hymn book. They're just on there if you want to grab them. There's the two of them. I was going to run down and give you mine, but that would have been weird. <laughs> a Church for All is the title of our um, children's story, or Time for All Ages, this morning. And it's written by Gail E. Pittman and illustrated by Laura Fournier. And Gordon is going to turn the pages for me so that I don't have to go like this to read it. And then I'm going to read the back page of the book when after we read the book. Sunday waking day is breaking. Let's go to our church for all. Church bells ringing, joyful noises. Choir singing, laughing voices. Candles glowing, we have candles. Banners flowing, we have banners. Come, enter our church for all. Weak and healthy, Neat and messy, and I would add here and there. Poor and wealthy, plain and dressy. All embracing, spirit gracing, each one at our church for all. Bodies wiggling, usually little bodies, parents reading, children giggling, parents pleading, please sit still, toddlers flailing, I have a toddler grandson, they flail, babies wailing, there's room at our church for all, hands receiving, but stay six feet apart, Hands connecting, don't touch. Hearts believing, hearts accepting. Feel the spirit? Can you hear it? Here. It's here at our church for all. And before we sing uh, the next hymn, Come Thou Font of Every Blessing, much faster than you're used to singing it, that's a, um, I would like to read the back page of this book. It's fairly long, but it's important. Author's note. Years ago, a friend encouraged me to attend a service at Glide Memorial Church, and I was very reluctant. I was raised in a church that wasn't at all accepting of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. Later, as an adult in the LGBT community, LGB, this was written a while ago, so I would add LGBTQ+, two-spirited, I've been to churches where I didn't feel welcomed. Many churches still preach the idea that being lesbian, gay, bisexual, etc. is wrong. And as a result, many LGBT people feel as if there is no place for them in a church. But my friend, who is a lesbian, said, Glide was different. You'll love it, she said. It's a rock-your-world experience. We have a ways to get to that, but we will. And it did. In fact, rock my world, she said. For the first time, I found a spiritual community that fully accepted and embraced me. That's what I wanted to capture in this, in this book, this, the church, A Church for All. The story of Glide begins in the 1920s when Lizzie Glide, a Methodist philanthropic person, purchased a plot of land at the intersection of Ellis and Taylor Streets in the Tenderloin District of San Francisco, 
I should move up and I should have asked the camera person where they wanted me to stand. I'm sorry. <laughs> the construction of Clyde Memorial Church was completed two years later. Beginning in the 1950s, many middle-class white families began leaving city neighborhoods like the Tenderloin and moving to the suburbs, a, phenom a phenomenon known as white flight. As a result, the Tenderloin became associated with crime, poverty, homelessness, drugs, and violence. At the same time, a group of p new pastors joined Glide, and their values and goals overlapped with the vision of the civil rights movement and other social justice efforts. Reverend Cecil Williams, who was a part of that group, is still at Glide today and continues to be a major presence at the church. And I'm going to skip some of it because it is very long. And so I'm going to just say that the spirit of Glide's mission is what rocked my world years ago. I'm grateful to all the spiritual communities throughout the world from every denomination that welcome, accept, embrace, and celebrate us for who we are. And I would say that we are one of those that accept and celebrate people for who they are and where they are. A church for all. That's what we are. And now I invite you to rise in body or spirit and sing our next hymn, 126. Count your blessings. Come thou font of every blessing. We're going to rock it a little bit because that's just who we are. Go for it. One of the purposes of this church community is to encourage all who gather here to grow more generous in spirit and action. In addition to supporting this community, we also make a monthly commitment to the wider community. One half of the unidentified cash that is received is given to an outside organization. For the month of January, we are supporting Change for Children, in cooperation with the indigenous people in developing countries, Change for Children aims to identify the root causes of poverty and, in the spirit of solidarity, assists in finding long-term solutions. For 45 years, Change for Children has promoted health and human rights by championing creative solutions to poverty through sustainable development. Offering plates are located at each of our exits, those in the sanctuary may leave a donation at the end of our service. 
You can also use the envelopes found inside your hymn books as you wish uh, to receive a tax receipt for your gifts. Please indicate on your envelope your contact information so that we can send you a tax receipt at the year end. Donations can also be made through our UCE website or by visiting the Change for Children website. We thank you for your generosity of spirit and action. Through all that we do here in this community and the wider world, we are involved in the important spiritual work of creation and compassion. Let us join in singing from you I receive. So it's our time for meditation, for quietude, for reflection, and here is how it's going to go today. It's fairly familiar. I seem to be stuck in a pattern. So um, I have a poem by Mary Oliver entitled Mysteries. Yes. And I'm going to read it through three times with a brief pause in between and we'll share a few moments of silence, and then we'll move into our candles of joy and concern. And remember to socially distance as we do the candles, and to use the water glass to extinguish your candle. And if you are new here and haven't done candles with us, we line up over here and come around and face so that people on... Um, at home can see us, not just our backs. And um, if you are unsure what to do, don't go first and watch. So let's prepare our hearts and minds for a moment of, of um, for a time of, of silence, of introspection. And I invite you to do that by focusing in on your breath. Take a couple of deep cleansing breaths. Notice how our bodies allow the breath to come in and then close up as it leaves. Notice too how the floor, the chair, the bed, the pavement, whatever it is, is supporting you and holding you to the ground. Notice how your body is in contact with it. And then allow yourself to sink a little bit further, letting go a little bit more. I invite you to draw your attention to areas of tension, unease. Are there areas in your body that need a little bit of care? Breathe into them. Allow your energy, your healing breath, to give you comfort. Mysteries. Yes. Truly, we live with mysteries too marvelous to be understood. How grass can be nourishing in the mouths of the lambs how rivers and stones are forever in allegiance with gravity, while we ourselves dream of rising. 
how two hands touch and the bonds will never be broken. How people come from the delight or the scars of damage to the comfort of a poem. Let me keep my distance always from those who think they have the answers. Let me keep company always with those who say, look and laugh in amazement and bow their heads. Mysteries, yes. Truly, we live with mysteries too marvelous to be understood. How grass can be nourishing in the mouths of the lambs. How rivers and stones are forever in allegiance with gravity while we ourselves dream of rising. How two hands touch and the bonds will never be broken. How people come from delight or from the scars of damage to the comfort of a poem. Let me keep my distance always from those who think they have the answers. Let me keep company always with those who say, look and laugh in astonishment and bow their heads. Truly, we live with mysteries too marvelous to be understood. How grass can be nourishing in the mouths of the lambs. How rivers and stones are forever in allegiance with gravity. While we ourselves dream of rising. How two hands touch and the bonds will never be broken. How people come from delight or the scars of damage to the comfort of a poem. Let me keep my distance always from those who think they have the answers. Let me keep company always with those who say, look and laugh in astonishment and bow their heads. Take a few moments of silence. And when you are ready, I invite you to line up to my left, to your right, and take a candle and light it, extinguish it in the water and put it in the basket. These candles are of joy, of concern, of remembrance, of things that are important to you. Whenever you are ready, I invite you.
Thank you, Karen. And Gordon, thank you in uh, lighting a final candle for all the unlit, unspoken joys and concerns we carry with us in our hearts. And as he does that, let us remember that every candle represents a person, a thought, a heartache, a joy, a celebration. These are real. Thank you. Brief reading to start by the Reverend A. Powell Davis. Uh, he is a UU minister, and he says, Let me tell you why I come to church. I come to church and would, whether I was a preacher or not, because I fall below my own standards, and I need to be constantly brought back up to them. I am afraid of becoming selfish and indulgent, and my church, my church of the free spirit, brings me back to what I want to be. I could easily despair, doubt and dismay could overwhelm me, my church renews my courage and my hope. It is not enough that I should think about the world and its problems at the level of a newspaper or a uh, newspaper report or a magazine discussion. It could too soon become too low a level. I must have my conscience sharpened. Sharpened until it goads me into the most thorough and responsible thinking of which I am capable. I must feel again the love I owe to others. I must not only hear about it, but feel it. In church I do. I am brought back to my best self in every way toward my best. End of quote. When I read that in the um, packet that comes with the monthly theme, I went, that's it. I want to talk about that. So that's where the title of this service came from, from uh, with thanks to Reverend A. Powell Davis. A long time ago, I was the music director at a small Unitarian Universalist fellowship in Kamloops, at the only one there, actually, in Kamloops, British Columbia. Uh, Reverend Dr. Philip Hewitt planted that church, and from time to time he would come up to Kamloops to preach. He was always well received, and I loved working with him. Such a professional, and he had such a warm and caring way about him. I loved being in his presence. And then while I was in seminary, I did get the chance to, to get to know him quite well. I used to give him rides re regularly to our collegial gatherings. And he was definitely a remarkable man. But I digress. So this one time when I was in Kamloops, and he came and came up to preach, he said something that has stuck with me ever since. He said, I go to church to water the flowers that are in the garden of my soul. And I don't know if, does anybody remember Reverend Philip Hewitt? About 10 feet tall and skinny as a bone, bone, uh, bean pole. And he, and he had scoliosis or kyphosis. So he had this, his, his back was kind of like this. You know, and there's his head, and he, he, it, he was just a fantastic man. In his 90s, there he was with his walking sticks, out walking most of us. Okay, where was I? Okay, so I think he got this saying from somewhere else, but I don't know where. And so we'll just attribute it to him. And I pondered this statement for a long time, and I still do. What in the world did he mean by that exactly? His take is so much different than Reverend Powell's take on why he goes to church. So I thought it was quite interesting. 
So, but when I think back to when I went to church before I became a minister, I would have to say that I was there for the community. When I was a single parent with two very intelligent and active children, I went to church for support and reassurance that I wasn't messing up too terribly. My kids found a community, activities, adults that paid attention to them, and I found some good friends that I could do things with. One of them is still my good friend from that time at Kamloops United Church. My time as a member of Kamloops United Church showed me what congregational life could be. I learned how to do committee work. I discovered that I had a better leadership potential. Surprise, surprise. And as I went through some difficult times, one person in particular, the music director, a leader in the congregation gave me a lot of her time, and she gave me a lot of her support. I am so very grateful to Kamloops United Church and my time there that I would say, and I would say my life was enriched, enlivened, and made better by them. I did a lot of healing there. Enough about me. I want you to stop and think about for a moment about why you go to church. Why are you here? Why are you here in person? Why are you here online? Ask yourself, why do I go to church? And let that question circle around you while we go through the rest of the service. Why do you go to church? I can tell you all day why I do. I'm a church nerd. I love church. But why are you here? In the children's story, we heard about a person that needed community that affirmed and promoted her inherent worth and dignity. Gail Pittman says that she was raised in a church that wasn't accepting of everyone. Glide Church sounds an awful lot like us, doesn't it? Accepting and celebrating. But of course, we don't actually accept and celebrate everyone. And every congregation has their biases. And that's okay. The trick is figuring out what ours is and yours is, and then going out on those growing edges and then having the courage to stay there when it's a little uncomfortable so that we can figure it out and grow. So perhaps one aspect, so perhaps that is one aspect of doing church together we can talk about at some time. Here's a statement that maybe perhaps works. Why? What, what we're doing here. Church allows us a chance to stop and reflect, sink into the comfort of familiarity, of knowing that we are truly accepted. And here in this space, we can feel and heal, understand ourselves better, and find joy. A former professor at the Vancouver School of Theology, Reverend Dr. Janet Gere, used to say, we go deep so we can go wide. We find comfort, healing, reflection, familiarity, support. We dig in, and then when we are ready, we get out there on our growing edges into the community and explore what it means to take risks, to maybe even fail and then come back and reflect on what might need to change. And then when we are ready, we can try that again. A congregant who won't be named. <laughs> Hi, John. <laughs> uh, congregant and I were talking recently, yesterday actually, about that process and that action reflection process that needs to happen if we are to grow personally and as a church. I'm not talking growth in numbers here, but rather growing into the church community that we have the potential to be. In her book, Church Works, a well-body book for congregations, Anne Heller says, what is a well congregation? Imagine the finest human body you can, perhaps a world-class athlete, someone at your local gym, a friend. 
What makes those bodies strong, healthy, and beautiful? This is an older book, and I'm kind of like, eh. I have an issue with, with her idea of what is, beautiful, what is a beautiful body. But I'll leave it there. This was written a while ago. The answer is likely a combination of exercise, relaxation, nutritious food, challenging and useful work, engagement in life, the love and support of family, colleagues, and friends, and plenty of stimulation. That's a lot of things that go into a well person. Isn't it likely that a well congregation knows how to join in the satisfactions of shared work, to relax, to worship, to meditate together, to be stimulated, supported, and challenged to personal growth, to exercise its social learning and justice muscles, to receive intellectual, spiritual, and emotional stimulation, and to be fed well, well fed by the time, talent, and treasures of its members. However, each congregational body, like each individual, has a worth and dignity and a beauty. To be human is to be imperfect. The idea for this book is health, not perfection. There are 13 chapters in her book, each one metaphorically discussing how different aspects of church are correlated to different parts of the body. The brain, for example, are the core documents of the church, bylaws, policies, and procedures. The ears fostering good communication. This is a really helpful book, and it's in our library to help you understand or help us understand how the church is really smaller systems working together for a benefit of a whole system. And when the different parts work well together, when the brain, for example, understands it must have breath, breath and spirit, she says, is animating congregational life and includes things like values, worship, and spiritual support groups. Programming, basically. My favorite chapter in the book is Skin, Hair, and Nails. One section in the chapter is titled... Easy and inexpensive makeovers. It's pretty clever. And of course we know from owning and operating within the confines of a body, because we all have one, that if one part of the body isn't working well, it throws off the whole system. If I have a sore back, for example, it impedes my ability to make dinner, clean my house, go shopping, get exercise, get a good night's sleep, or concentrate. You get the idea. Therefore, we can't ignore any one part of the congregation if we wish to have genuinely rich and healthy outcomes. Alain de Botton, a British philosopher, has a TED Talk from 2011 you may have heard of or watched. It's called Atheism 2.0. Has anybody watched it? One. No? Anybody online? It's excellent. I encourage you to watch it. Like, go home and watch it. Atheism 2.0, Alan de Botin. He has some great TED Talks out there. He suggests that the premise of, that the premise of, of, um, of course there is no big G God, is the starting point, not the end. So Alan um, de Botin talks about how he is an atheist, so he doesn't believe in God, but that doesn't mean Unitarian Universalists don't believe in God. This is his, him speaking, not me. So he suggests that the fact to him that there is no God is the starting point, not the end. So, okay, so there's no God, now what? Is basically what he's saying. And he has the same premise in his book, Religion for Atheists. A Non-Believer's Guide to the Uses of Religion. And he says that religion gets a lot of things right. Ritual, he says, is used to enforce, thing, enforce things like forgiveness, reflection, remembering important points, 
Here's a quote from his TED Talk. In the early 19th century, church attendance in Western Europe started sliding down very, very sharply, and people panicked. They asked themselves the following question. They said, where are people going to find morality? Where are they going to find guidance? And where are they going to find sources of consolation? And influential voices came up with one answer. They said, culture. It's to culture that we should look to guidance for consolation for morality. Let's look to the plays of Shakespeare, the dialogues of Plato, the novels of Jane Austen. In there, we'll find a lot of the truths that we might previous, previously found in the Gospel of John. Now, I think that that's a very beautiful and true idea, he says. They wanted to replace scripture with culture. It's a very plausible idea. It's also an idea that we have forgotten. If, so he says, if you went to a top university and you said you went to ha Oxford, Harvard, or Cambridge, and you said, I've come here because I'm in search of morality, guidance, and consolation. He says, I want, he says and I want to know how to live. And he says, I, they would show you to the, in, the way to the insane asylum. <laughs> this is not what our grandest and best institutes of higher learning are in the business of, which is true. Kids feel very alone in universities. Why? They don't think we need it. They don't think we are in an urgent need of assistance. They see us as adults, rational adults. What we need is information, they think. We need data. We don't need help. And religions start from a very different place indeed. All religions, all major religions at various points, call us children. And like children, they believe that we are in severe need of assistance. We're only just holding it together. And sometimes I will admit that I am just barely holding it together. Not today. Today's a good day. Perhaps this is just me, Ben, maybe you, but anyway, he thinks and says we're only just holding it together. We all need help. And so we need guidance and we need learning. And he says, let's think of something else. The people in, mo in the modern world, in the secular world, who are interested in the matters of the spirit, in matters of the mind, in higher soul-like concerns, tend to, tend to be isolated individuals. They're poets, they're philosophers, they're photographers, and they're filmmakers. And they tend to be on their own. They are vulnerable, single people. Now think about religions. Think about organized religions. What do organized religions do? They group together. They form institutions. And that has all sorts of advantages. You could say corporations are very much like religions, except that they're right down at the bottom of the pyramid of needs. They're selling us cars and shoes. Whereas the people who are selling us the higher stuff, the therapists, the poets, are on their own and they have no power. They have no might. So religions are the foremost example of an institution that is fighting for the things of the mind and I would say the spirit. Books alone, books written by lone individuals are not going to change anything. We need to group together. If you want to change the world, you have to group together. And that's what religions do. They are multinational. They are branded. They have a clear identity. So they don't get lost in a busy world. That's something that we can learn from. 
So he says, my concluding point is you may not agree with religion, but at the end of the day, religions are so subtle, so complicated, so intelligent in many ways that they're not fit to be abandoned to the religious alone. They're for all of us, he says. This is so important for us to understand that we have something very special. We, as Unitarian Universalists, can really lay claim to what Alain de Botton is saying about the secular world. And we can lay claim to being part of a large, multinational, branded religion. I need to be part of something bigger than myself. I need to know that I am involved in what I am involved in is also advancing UU values into the world. That is what part of the UUA, the Unitarian Universalist Association's mission statement states. And the mission statement of the UUA is to equip congregations for health and vitality, to support and train lay and professional leaders, both in Canada and in the United States, the UUA still does all the vetting of the professional leaders, and to advance Unitarian Universalist values in the world. And they do with that with our collective power, with our money in the, in the boardrooms of the major organizations of the world that hold our values. We are part of a religion, and many of us do believe in a higher power. Call it God or something else, it doesn't matter. I want to be clear that when I say we can lay claim to what de Pont Baton is saying, I don't mean that we're exactly like that, that we're atheists, we're not. So at the beginning I asked you to ponder why you come to church. We've covered many things here, but I want to briefly go back to Reverend Dr. Philip Hewitt's comment about watering the flowers in the garden of our souls. This month, we are talking about intention. What if we took a moment and intentionally thought about our inner life, the garden of our soul? How does church help you nurture your inner life? How do you intentionally show up for yourself? How do you f intentionally show up for yourself here when you come to church on Sunday mornings or when you go to a board meeting or to choir practice or even when we hire a new staff member? How does going to church, being part of this church, allow you to water the flowers in the garden of your soul? Taking the metaphor of the garden one step further, gardening is work, intentional work. And for it to be successful, it has to be healthy from the soil to the blossoms. May we learn to garden together. To learn how to be open to the intention of becoming our best selves to our, allow ourselves to be brought up short, ask forgiveness, and try again. May we understand that sometimes we are the blossom and sometimes we're the weed. May we learn to be part of a healthy system that doesn't shy away from doing the work that must be done. And may we have the courage to begin anew each and every day. So may it be. Amen. And I invite you to take about 30 seconds to just sit with that. And then open your hymn books when you're ready to 1008 in the Teal Hymn Book, when our heart is in a holy place.
Please be seated. I would like to invite Ruth up again to extinguish our chalice. And as she does so, I offer you these words by Eric Walker Wickstrom. If you are who you were, and if the person next to you is who he or she was, if none of us has changed since the day we came in here, we have failed. The purpose of this community, of any church, temple, zendo, mosque, is to help its people grow. We do this through encounters with the unknown, in ourselves, in one another, in the other, whatever that might be for us however hard it might be for us, because these encounters have many gifts to offer. So may we go forth from here this morning, not who we were, but who we could be. So may we all. Closing words, or benediction, whatever you want to call it, From the Talmud, the Talmud states, do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now. Love mercy now. And walk humbly now. You are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. Go in peace, gentle people. Go in peace. Amen. And I invite us into a configuration that we can sing together, carry the flame. If you're new here, we usually kind of just face each other and sing carry the flame, carry the flame of peace and love until we meet again. Those are the words. I invite you now to stand and um, pretend you're joining hands, but don't. <laughs> 